Hi guys, it's Cornish Kayak Angler from www.kitefishing.blog and today I'm going to talk to you about my fishing kite setup. Uh, I get lots of emails and messages about uh, sort of how I uh, have things rigged on my kayak, uh, things I use, uh, where things are mounted, etc. So I uh, thought I'd put a video together showing my sort of entire setup, sort of how I'd have my kite laid out on a typical fishing session. So um, I'm going to talk about some things like gear storage on the kayak, uh, the electronics I use, um, even down to sort of fishing rods and reels I use and uh, sort of various items of uh, tackle and other accessories that would uh, come with me on a typical kite fishing session. So uh, yeah, let's start by talking about uh, the kayak I use. Okay, so this is my fishing kayak. It's the Hobie Revolution 16. It's a 2017 model. Um, 16 foot in length. Um, and with a width of just under 28 inches, so quite a long fishing kayak. Um, basic with the fishing kayaks, uh, the longer their sort of length or uh, particularly their waterline length, uh, sort of faster they are through the water and more efficiently they sort of cut through the water. So, um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of shorter, wider ones, quite a sort of bit slower than these sort of longer, more narrow ones. So a uh, kayak of this sort of length, really built for speed, uh, built for the sort of open ocean conditions, coastal conditions where you might be sort of experiencing a bit of chop, a bit of wind, um, uh, some swell, you know, the kayak like this really does cut through it quite well. So the Hobie Revolution, a little different to the sort of standard fishing kayaks um, in the fact that this is a pedal drive kayak. So this is a kayak propelled through the water using a, it's called a Hobie Mirage Drive. Uh, so instead of paddling, as you would with a sort of standard fishing kite, um, you're actually using your legs to power this kite using the uh, drive here. And this is the uh, Hobie Mirage drive. So uh, it's operated by sort of pushing your feet uh, sort of to and fro on the pedals and it drives the fins side to side under the, under the kayak, under the water. Uh, and that, that's enough to uh, sort of push the kite through the water with sort of incredible efficiency really. Um, this is a system sort of signed by Hobie come about from sort of looking at penguins and how they move through the water using their sort of flippers going side to side and uh, the clever guys at Hobie have come up with this system, the Mirage Drive, which has been around for a number of years now. Uh, it's really sort of proven its uh, worth amongst the sort of kite fishing community uh, as a sort of really efficient way to move on the water. And this is their latest incarnation, the Mirage Drive 180. Uh, it's come out this year. Um, quite novel in the fact that not only as you pedal does it drive you forward, um, a simple pull of a toggle, the fins flip around, and you continue pedaling forward, but instead of going forward, you're actually going in reverse. So quite a quite a clever system there. And uh, with this system, I mean, as you're moving the kayak with your feet, your hands are left free, and uh, obviously for fishing that brings a number of advantages. You know, you can be on the move whilst having a rod in your hand, sort of fishing away, trolling a lure, whatever it may be. Um, you know, as you're fighting a fish, you can actually be moving the kayak, uh, maybe moving it away from a snag, or uh, you know, just backing off, putting a bit more pressure onto the fish. So, uh, I mean, there's a number of advantages that this system brings about, um, as opposed to sort of paddling a fishing kayak. And uh, yeah, a very clever system. Just simply uh, plugs into the hole, into a couple of receiving ports, it's locked in, and uh, yeah, the fins just move under the kite there. So, very clever system, very efficient, and that really does uh, sort of drive the hole through the water really well. And uh, you know, typically, sort of without putting too much effort in, I can sort of cruise it around four and a half, five knots, um, put a bit more effort in. With sort of view to getting somewhere quicker. Um, quite happily achieved six knots out of this hole, which uh, in terms of fishing kites is uh, pretty quick. It's one of the sort of quickest ones out there really. Um, and where it really proves its worth is when in windy conditions. Um, the Mirage Drive, it just grips the water so well it stops uh, the sort of wind affecting the hole really. It really just drives through a headwind, drives through a wind really well. Um, quite often uh, notice it if you're out there with uh, people who are paddling kayaks. Uh, this particular kite just just goes straight through the wind in conditions, whereas uh, paddling uh, can be held back quite a bit with the with the wind. So uh, so yeah, that's a 
brief overview of the, uh, the, the Hobie Revolution 16. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll take a closer look at some of the features and uh, go through uh, some how I've kitted out this kayak for, for kayak fishing. Okay, so we'll just uh, take a closer look at some of the sort of features that come as standard on the uh, Hobie Revolution 16 fishing kayak uh, before I sort of start talking about how I've sort of rigged it up for my kayak fishing. So uh, we just spoke about the uh, Hobie Mirage drive and uh, we can see that fitted in the kayak here. Um, simply just uh, plugged in place these little click and go ports. I have the, the Mirage drive leashed um, just in the event of it ever popping out, you know, I'm not going to go losing it overboard. It's quite an expensive bit of kit. But uh, that simply just uh, pops in there with a little push, engages into these click and go ports here, and uh, that's held in place now for, for sort of pedaling in use. You can just see under the kayak there how those fins are operating through the water. So moving on, uh, the Hobie's come with a very comfortable um, Vantage CT seat. So. Uh, it's what's called sort of a deck chair style seat where the, the seat's lifted off the hull slightly. You can sort of see that um, fully adjustable in that you can tilt it, you can uh, raise the base and uh, you can really find sort of a comfortable position for, for fishing. And uh, you know, you're out there for several hours on the water, you don't want to be uh, sort of doing your back in. So uh, something like this, very comfortable um, for several hours out there. Moving back, we uh, also have on the Hobies uh, a rudder system sort of pre-installed. It's called their sort of twist and stow rudder system. Uh, it's all operated from the, the sort of cockpit up there near the, near the seat, but um, it's, it's sort of you can just twist it up onto the onto the deck there by pulling a toggle in the uh, in the cockpit um, sort of when you're coming into beach, and uh, you know when you want to use it, you just pull another toggle and that flips down into place and. Uh, will be operated up here so here we have a, a, an up toggle you just get that pull that that pulls the, the rudder up onto the deck and uh, again down we just give that a pull and that, that pulls the, the rudder engages it into the water uh, and steering all off a all off a little handle here so as you're pedaling along you can uh, be sort of directing yourself there as to where to go so there's a couple of sort of standard features there that come come with a Hobie. Uh, it also includes a paddle. Now with a Mirage Drive 99% of the time you are using using the uh, drive to move but um, sort of as you're just launching off the beach uh, you can sort of have the drive out so you're not uh, sort of bashing it against the, the bottom um, or you can, uh, you can sort of push one pedal forwards which uh, pops the fins flat against the hull um, just for sort of launching and landing purposes so that you're not uh, bashing the fins up but um, sort of that's when you sort of use this paddle just to uh, sort of get out first few yards until it's sort of deep enough to uh, drop the fins down and uh, sort of pedal and away you go but the Hobies as standard come with a, a paddle um, it's a fiberglass shaft two-piece push-button design there uh, nice and lightweight sort of reinforced blades there but uh, just sort of a standard paddle there to uh, for use but it's nice that they sort of come with the Hobies I mean it's also there as a backup for if ever that uh, Mirage Drive failed for for whatever reason um, you know it's a, it's a complex bit of uh, kit there you know sort of any sort of a complex uh, bit of kit you know there is chances of things failing etc you know it's, it's pretty rare on the, the Mirage Drives to be honest but you never know so You've always got the paddle there as, a, as your backup, just in case you needed to uh, get back in uh, if the Mirage Drive failed. And then that just sort of simply sits on the side of the kayak in a, in a paddle holder. Okay, so as sort of kayak fishermen, we uh, obviously need to carry some kit on the kayak. Um, you know, various items of tackle and bits and bobs, rods, etc. to uh, sort of for the session so uh i'm just going to run through sort of where i store various things on the kayak um how i have things laid out there so uh let's take a look i mean the uh hobie revolution it's got a fairly big uh bow hatch so sort of just under these bungees here opens up a cover which is a leash there uh inside big big storage area in here i have 
um, wheels for my trolley, um, Sea Tug Sandtrax trolley. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But also the other, other parts of that trolley are uh, sort of stored in there with still plenty of space left. Also in there I've got the, uh, my waterproof battery box for my fish finder. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, sort of in this bow storage area, you sort of put things in there that you don't really need to access when you're on the water. You know, it's quite a way up from the seat there, so uh, it's not the easiest thing to access whilst you're on the water. So stuff goes in there that uh, we don't really need for our day on the water, but you need it sort of when you come back shore. So, uh, you know, I put my trolley in there. You could have a dry bag in there with some uh, spare change of clothing, whatever it may be. Uh, or if you're on a multi-day trip, maybe you can uh, shove a load of camping gear in there. Um, that's in there, sort of waterproof storage area. Uh, sort of rubber gaskets on this hatch lid and hatch hatch seal there. So uh, sort of nice waterproof fit, especially with those bungees that sort of holds it all down tight. Sort of moving back to the cockpit, you know, this is where we sort of have stuff that we, uh, we need to hand on the water. So uh, sort of bits of tools, maybe a bait, etc. So uh, on this Hobie here, we, we, we find a sort of centre storage hatch here. Just sort of twist this toggle, pop it open. Uh, beneath there, I've got a, what's called a d d deep gear bucket. Uh, so it's a storage bucket there. I can sort of put in there some bait, um, bits of tackle if I need to, but I mainly put my bait in there. That can be lifted out and it sort of gives a bigger storage area again under there to uh, put, put bits and bobs if needed. Um, that pops in there, easy access to my bait whilst on the water. It's sort of perfect for packets of sand eels, ragworm, lugworm, whatever you may be using. That, that screws down there with a nice sort of tight waterproof seal. So also in the cockpit, uh, we find these side storage pockets. I mean, here I've got um, the upgraded rubber uh, map hookless pockets on there. Uh, stops you sort of getting hooks getting caught up in it. Uh, as standard, the Hobie's come with a, a mesh pocket, but but I've added on uh, these rubber ones there as a sort of upgrade. Uh, quite popular with a with a kite fisherman. Um, but in here, I like to keep things like scissors, was handy from the water. My uh, sort of filleting knife, and uh, quite often I have a few weights and bits and bobs in there. A few spare laws, perhaps, what, which I'm using whilst on the water. So that's all there, easy to hand, uh, easy to uh, access whilst you're, whilst you're fishing. Moving back, large rear tank well. Uh, here is usually where you store sort of most of your main gear whilst sort of fishing. Um, common feature on sort of any fishing kayak is a, is a storage crate in the rear tank well. Um, you can make them from sort of collapsible storage crates. Uh, you can pick them up cheap and uh, make a you know a decent sort of storage system out of one of those. Uh, I mean, this one I'm using here. It's uh, manufactured by Hobie themselves. It's called a H crate. Um, big, big storage area. Sits in the tank well. Strapped down by these webbing straps here. Makes it a really sort of strong, strong fit. Sits in there really well, but. Uh, that's a massive storage area inside and in here I like to keep sort of my anchor reel. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, just got my anchor, some tackle storage tubs, these are sort of waterproof ones, click seal ones. So in there, there I've got loads of uh, tinsels, feathers, sabiki rigs etc. And my hooks and swivels, beads, terminal tackle, all in that tub there with all my weights inside, a few spools of line, sort of just sort of all the bits and bobs I need uh, whilst fishing on the water. So easy to access really whilst you're on the water. You're sitting in the seat there, you just got to reach behind. I mean, if you can sit side saddle on the seat and it makes it a little easier again to sort of look inside the crate and uh, reach what you need. I mean, this Hobie H crate, as you'll be able to see, it's got a number of rod holders built into it as well, upright rod holders. Uh, great for sort of storing your rods whilst uh, on the move out there on the water. Uh, also, the handles of this crate made from what's called H rail. It's a Hobie specific rail. Um, I think it's 12 sided. Uh, and to that, you can attach a number of accessories like this uh, mount I've got here. I'll speak a little more about that later. Uh, but yeah, really sort of bomb proof crate there. Uh, perfect for storing all the 
sort of larger items to tackle and gear that you need whilst on the water. You can easily sort of get your lunch inside there or a flask or a bottle of drink, whatever it may be as well. Uh, just behind the sort of seat in between the H crate and seat back, there is a bit of still bit of space there. And I like to put in there sort of, you know, big sort of bags of bait if I'm um, taking sort of whole mackerel, anything like that, I can sort of, sort of store that all behind the seat there within sort of easy reach. Moving to the back of the kite, there is another storage hatch. Uh, another one we just sort of twist open and lift up. I mean, I don't really put a lot in here, to be honest. Uh, not a lot goes in there, but I do have a little uh, Aquapack waterproof storage tub. And inside that, I put my car keys whilst on the water. So uh, they're sort of kept dry. Don't want to go getting those wet. Um, so that's all in there. Sometimes I'll take a bit of spare money out as well, just in case I ever, ever needed it for any reason. that's all in there so uh loads of storage on this kayak loads of places to put gear uh, so you can take plenty with you on the water or as, or as little as you like really okay let's uh go on and talk about the rod holders on this kayak uh, obviously we're out there fishing uh, we're going to need to carry some rods with us um, so let's have a little look at uh, sort of how they're stored whilst traveling on the water and uh, sort of uh, various rod holders for whilst you're fishing. So uh, I mentioned a little uh, just in the last section there uh, about the Hobie H crate. It's got four uh, upright vertical rod holders built into the uh, corners of the crate. Uh, these, are, these are really good for sort of just popping the rods in whilst you're sort of pedaling around on the water, moving from mark to mark or whatever it may be. Uh, so they're sticking up right uh, out the way. They're not sticking out to the side or anything where you might sort of catch something. Um, but yeah, easy to access, just behind the seat. Just sort of reach around, grab one, out it comes. Um, so with, with, with the Hobie, they do do come with a couple of flush mounted rod holders built in into the beside the tank well. Uh, they pop in there. They do stick out to the side a little bit. Um, but they're fine again for sort of popping your rods in whilst you're sort of moving about. I mean, you can put your rods in there whilst you're sort of trolling the lure behind the kayak. But um, I mean, with the Hobie, the beautiful thing is you can be on the move uh, and have the rod in your hand. So uh, you can actually troll a lure and hold the rod at the same time. So you can sort of be in always in connection with the lure and know what's going on. Uh, sort of have hold of it the instant you get, you get a hit on your lure, uh, which works really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's potential of see six rod holders here at the back the four in the h crate the two sort of flush mounted ones uh, molded into the kayak at the back um i mean on a typical session i'll 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 take two rods out of me sometimes three um occasionally if it's a competition i will take four out all sort of kitted up ready to go um but but yeah it's, it's sort of easy to store those rods there at the back I mean, whilst fishing um slightly different set out in that you know you usually want them in the in sort of front of you so you can see what's going on with the rod tips um i, I myself i uh i'm a fan of uh, the front rod rests uh this thing here that you see um so that's a s sort of bar there um which you can sort of lay your rod tips on so uh, if i grab a rod there you can sort of lay it there bang in front of you you know easily have a couple out and you just rest on there so your rod tips are nice and low to the sort of water you, know, you can i can adjust this rod holder in height um, works really well for when you're fishing at anchor or drifting baits um, rod tips right there in front of you you can see every sort of movement going on with the rod tips um, so that, that's, a, that's a really good good system there and uh, i like to sort of just wedge the butts under the seat there and it sort of holds it all in place for uh, sort of when you get a bite it's not going to be sort of going anywhere uh, that that works really well that that rod rest and uh, I've what I've done here is um, utilise the sail mount that comes on the Hobies uh, just below where I'm pointing here. There's a there's a tube and into that tube I've uh, fitted a 1.5 inch ramble um, and there's a sort of wedge mount which uh, you put in there, screw up and it tightens into the the tube and uh, from that I've mounted a 18 inch ram extension arm, 1.5 inch socket at one end. Uh, and the one inch at the other uh, onto that we've got a, a one inch round ball um, and a little adapter which goes onto the uh, bank stick thread there for the uh, for the this is a maver ripple rod rest 
it works really well for resting your rods on whilst you're fishing but also whilst you're sort of tackling up or baiting up you just sort of plonk your rod there and uh, you know put the bait on the hook or tie new hooks on whatever it may be uh, but that that works really well like I say for, for when you're trolling you can just sort of hold the rod but um, you can you can put tro trolling rod holders onto this kayak uh, I've got it set up where um, these don't come as standard but I've added the these slide tracks here um, I mean a lot of fishing kites now come with uh, some sort of slide track as standard um, the Hobies don't um, I'm sure they will in the future at some point but um, here I've uh, fitted an aftermarket track and uh, this is a Yak Attack GTTL 90 uh, 8 inch section really strong sort of track um, sort of marine grade alloy there um, comes with a the Yak Attack full back backing plate um, so that's a basically a length of uh, alloy bit which goes inside the kayak with uh, threaded holes which these bolts go down into and sort of clamps it all to the hull really strong setup but with the slide tracks they allow you to add accessories uh, into this track tighten them down um, it could be rod holders fish finder mounts camera mounts whatever it may be but it allows you to sort of easily add them and uh, take them away or move them whilst on the water whatever it may be but um, really handy little uh, bits of kit these um, but what I can do if I'm trolling and I don't want to hold the rod I just want it in position um, I can use this here it's a it's a Scotty bait caster um, got an extension arm on here also a, a Scotty gearhead adapter so um, track adapter there so that features a t-bolt in the base and that t-bolt slides into the track like so you just twist it until it tightens tighten it into position and then it's solid and uh, I can have a have a rod in there and that just slots in there like so and I can I can have that it's just it, the rod butt just comes high enough for me to still operate the pedals um, but I can be there watching the rod tip out far, um, trolling the law sort of off the side of the kayak. Um, that, that works quite well as well. But to be honest, I just like to sort of hold the rod whilst trolling, trolling along. Okay, we're going to talk a little about my, my anchoring system on the kayak. So I have an anchor system set up. Um, I mean, fishing at anchor sort of opens up a lot of new doors as to what species you can target you know some species will sort of only come um, if you're anchored uh, they won't take sort of moving baits as such so uh, anchor system very sort of useful for targeting those species um, also sort of very useful uh, in terms of safety as well if, uh, if the drift's a little too fast um, you know it's a bit too much hard work for you uh, sort of paddling around or pedaling around all the time um, keeping up with the drift, um, you can just sort of drop an anchor down and uh, wait for the sort of tide to subside or whatever it may be, and uh, you know, sort of sit static as opposed to drifting. Um, but you know, primarily it's for fishing, um, so we'll talk a little bit about how that's set up. Um, so, sort of as standard, kite, kites won't come with an anchor system, uh, these are sort of things you would retrofit yourself. Um, loads of kits out there to, to do that now, um, so sort of two components to the anchoring system uh, the first part is the anchor trolley uh, now this is a uh, basically a, a system which runs down the side of the kayak um, sort of comprised of a pulley at either end of the kayak um, and then a sort of loop line which runs between those pulleys um, and some form of ring or a carabiner clip um, that will shuttle from front to back um, and this will allow you to sort of position your anchor line um, either at the very bow of the kayak or at the very stern of the kayak uh, and I mean that's in place because uh, the safest place to anchor for on a kayak um, to have your anchor line sort of going off is either the stern or the bow um, so that your kayak it sits sort of in line with the conditions uh, be it the wind the tide uh, the swell whatever it may be um, if you were just to uh, chuck your anchor out tie it off to the side handle here something like that you would just sort of swing side on into the conditions uh, and if it's a bit choppy uh, you're going to get thrown out of your kayak um, 
and if you get thrown out of your anchored kayak that's going to cause all sorts of problems um, especially if you you drift away from the kayak um, it's going to be big problems so uh, the anchor trolley is there to allow you to position your anchor line off the usually off the very stern of the kayak that's sort of the most popular place to anchor from uh, but sometimes uh, you can anchor from the bow but um, that allows you to uh, do all that from the seat in position so uh, just run for it here here's the sort of the central piece of the uh, anchor trolley uh, here I've got a carabiner um, two stainless steel rings I'll uh, explain what that's for in a second but essentially you run your anchor line through this carabiner uh, from the seat um, and then you can just sort of shut all the the whole system back to the very stern and your anchor lines running off the back of the kayak uh, and that, that sort of keeps you sitting in line with the conditions uh, so here I've got a fitting here, a pad eye. Um, I've had to add that myself. Uh, that's been bolted on, uh, stainless bolts. Uh, I've gained access through the through the rear hatch to uh, bolt that that on there. Uh, a couple of drill holes, bit of sealant, and uh, that sort of fitted waterproof fitting. Um, to that, we've got clipped uh, here. I've got a Harkin pulley. It's a pulley with ball bearings, so a very smooth pulley. Um, that's there. That, 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 that comprises sort of the the back end of the uh, anchor trolley there and then if we sort of run to the front shuttle that to the front at the front we find a similar setup um, again I've got a pad eye fitted little chrome pad eye here uh, again bolted on reaching through from the, the front hatch there uh, and here you'll notice a, a length of elastic bungee cord uh, so that serves pur purpose as uh, acting as a sort of shock absorber in the whole system uh, works quite well, especially if it's choppy. Um, you know, the kite's getting bashed around quite a bit. Well, there's some play in this to uh, allow the sort of system to buffer itself. Uh, but also, it's to uh, keep the trolley nice and taut against the kayak, so it's not slopping around, it's not hanging low. Or you know, I see some kites with really sort of slack anchor trolleys, and uh, it's not going to work as efficiently as a, as a sort of a taut system here. Um, so yeah, you can sort of shuttle that to the front there. Um, you can, well off the front, it's quite common to uh, put a drogue off the front, so you can use this anchor trolley to uh, put a drogue line, a big uh, sort of drogue off the front of the kayak uh, to sort of slow the drift in windy conditions, uh, so the anchor trolley can be used for that, um, but I, I primarily use it just for anchoring. Um, but sort of once, once that anchor trolley is in position, um, beside the seat here I've got fitted a, a zigzag cleat, um, so that there, that, that that allows you once that anchor trolley is in place to sort of lock the anchor line through the teeth of the zigzag cleat, and that holds it in place. So that anchor trolley is not going to be slipping back whilst you're at anchor, sort of all held in position there. Uh, and again, that cleat's also used to uh, lock the anchor line off in my anchoring system. Um, but yeah, moving on to. Uh, sort of my, the anchor set up the second part uh, here I've got a 1.5 kilo grapnel anchor uh, one meter length of a six mil short link chain sort of really heavy stuff um, basically that that chain sort of adds weight to the system um, also puts weight off the nose of the anchor so it sort of causes that anchor to dig in um, with sort of more efficiency also acts as a as a buffer uh, so especially if it's choppy Slop, the kite's slopping about a lot on the surface that anchor will take up some of the sort of movement without affecting the anchor and causing it to sort of pull out so that's sort of what that's there for it causes the anchor to bite with more efficiency um, and here I have a small clip that allows me to clip off the anchor sort of for storage um, clip it on when I'm ready to use it and uh, that runs up to my anchor reel. It's a DIY homemade anchor reel uh, made out of a, a spool from a chandlery shop, empty spool that they sort of sell rope on. I managed to uh, get hold of one and uh, with a piece of uh, metal managed to make a handle and uh, use a, it's actually a Hobie uh, steering knob that you can attach to the uh, Hobie steering handle but I've managed to uh, use it on this reel as a sort of handle to wind the cord on with. But that's, it's got a load of cord on there, I think that's about 200 metres on there, so uh, I can sort of anchor in some really deep water with that or fast running tides, I can let loads of slack, sort of um, loads of warp out and uh, 
so that the anchor will hold well. But yeah, this is the cord which will run through that carabiner on the anchor trolley and uh, be shuttled to the back. Um, that's just my anchor setup. There's various ways of uh, anchoring a kite in the anchor setup, so, um, and various techniques to doing it. Um, perhaps I'll put another video together at some point to uh, run through all that. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of skill involved with it. Um, there's uh, not too much room for error when anchoring a kayak. It's probably one of the most dangerous things you can do whilst kayak fishing. Um, there's a lot of potential for things to go wrong and uh, you end up in the water. So uh, yeah, a little bit of skill, a little bit of thought involved in how you do it. Um, there's various quick release methods to uh, allow you to unanchor quickly um, if needed. Should uh, you sort of feel uneasy in the conditions or uh, you know sort of a, a yacht or something heading your way you need to get out of the way quick uh, you want to be able to unanchor quickly in my particular system of uh, unanchoring quickly pretty crude but um, that cord there I just get a knife and cut it and I'm away from the anchor um, but there are other systems where you might might see some with uh, using buoys, anchor buoys, where you can uh, sort of dump the whole setup and it will be floating off the buoy and uh, you can sort of go and pick it up at another time. But, um, I'll put another video together at some point uh, explaining both those methods and uh, how to go about anchoring a kayak. Okay, let's talk about the electronics on my kayak, um, namely the fish finder GPS I'm, I'm using. Um, so on the on the Hobie, I've got installed um, fish finder here. It's the Raymarine Dragonfly 5 Pro. So uh, yeah, fish finder and GPS chart plot are combined uh, within this unit. Um, around the unit here, you see this cover here. This, that's a Burley Pro sun visor. So uh, that acts to sort of shield the the kite from sort of splashes coming over the bow, but also sort of reduces the reflection off the off the screen. Um, from sort of bright sunlight uh, works quite well there um, but the fish finder itself um, it's got sort of the, the latest uh, chirp technology they call it um, uh, so that's a form of sonar which uh, shows up the fish really well in the water column um, and also down vision um, down vision can be seen on the uh, bottom here I'm not sure if it will show up on the video but um, basically down vision or down scan imaging uh, shows up uh, the bottom really well in really sort of high definition uh, if it's, particularly if you're in shallow water it's almost photographic uh, as to what you can see below the kayak but um, fish finder very very useful for sort of planning where you're going to fish you know you're not fishing sort of blind uh, it's sort of showing you what's beneath the kite there uh, giving you data on there what's happening down there so uh, you can sort of see you know if there's reefs there's drop-offs whether you have a sand uh, sand banks whatever it may be um, that will sort of uh, allow you to uh, make informed decisions on where you drop your bait or uh, place your anchor, cash and law, whatever it may be. Um, it's a really useful bit of kit. A lot of people nowadays fitting these to their, their fishing kayaks. Uh, sort of invaluable piece of kit really for fishing. I've got my fish finder mounted sort of dead centre at the, the sort of bow end of the footwell. Uh, sort of can sort of fully view, view everything there whilst on the move. Um, I've got it mounted here off a section of slide track, uh, again the Yak Attack gear track, uh, 8 inch section, front of the bow there, I've added that on myself. On top of that we've got a, a Ram uh, quick release track base, uh, 1 inch ball, onto a 1 inch double socket arm, uh, and a, a Ram, Ram ball which screws into the back of the unit. Uh, that's sort of fully adjustable there off this uh, ball and socket sort of system. Um, I can also at the end of the day easily remove this sort of bottom base here and uh, sort of fully take the uh, unit off. Um, so yeah, the uh, sort of talking about the wiring and how this is sort of installed on the kayak. Uh, sort of there's a connector plug which goes into the back of the unit, two wires coming out of it. One goes to the power source which is the battery. Uh, now that goes, sort of all the wiring goes down through this little deck seal here, waterproof fitting. Um, wiring goes down through there, through the hull. Uh, to the inside where in the bow here I've got my my battery um, that's fitted inside a waterproof battery box here which I sort of made up of a waterproof uh, sort of lunchbox storage container uh, works really well I've fitted a scan strut deck seal there on top to allow the uh, wire to come out from the battery um, battery is a 12 volt 7 amp hour battery uh, that's good for a couple of days sort of fishing before it needs recharging 
um, comes up to a sort of two pin connector there I can sort of pop that apart uh, take the battery out sort of when I'm packing away uh, or clip it together sort of when I'm setting up the kayak uh, allows me to remove the battery take it inside uh, and charge it up when needed uh, that sits in the bow I pop that in behind the sail mount on this kayak and uh, that's sort of stored in there whilst I'm on the water um, the other wire uh, goes to the transducer now the transducer is the bit of kit which um, basically shoots the sonar through the water uh, and sort of for best results that's got to be mounted in the water uh, you can glue them inside the hull um, using stuff like marine goop or e6000 sikaflex something like that you can actually bond them inside the hull and uh, the transducer will shoot through the plastic fine uh, without sort of any loss of clarity uh, and i've done that on a number of fishing kayaks uh, previously um, but with the Hobies, uh, it's got a really clever system, it's called the uh, Lowrance Ready system. Um, as the name suggests, it's sort of designed for Lowrance fish finders, uh, makes it really easy to sort of install them onto the kayak, but um, you can fit uh, the Raymarines onto it, uh, Garmin's and Hummingbirds. But essentially it's uh, comprised of a number of deck seals sort of located in the pockets. Uh, I can sort of have my fish finder mounted on these tracks, uh, wiring going through these sockets here uh, but i've mounted it out the front i've added another deck seal there where mine goes through but um the, the main part of the lowrance ready system is that um transducer wire goes through the hole comes up at the back of the tank well through a deck seal wiring goes uh into this scupper hole here in the center and that leads underneath the kayak you can see that there there's a big plate there and um, beneath that plate is a uh, is the transducer that's held in place there now uh as standard it comes with a slightly different plate to what i've got mounted there uh i said it was made for a lowrance fish finder um and uh lowrance fish finder is slightly different size transducers but um this is an aftermarket plate from uh the company burley pro same ones who made the uh fish finder sun visor but, um they've made an adapter plate there to allow this uh rain marine transducer which you can just see protruding there to uh, fit into this scupper recess here um, and under there is uh, yeah space where the transducer goes transducer just shoots through this cover and uh, reads what's in the water column and uh, it sort of puts that information back to the fish finder and puts it on a visual display so uh, that's sort of how uh, the transducer and battery are installed for that fish finder um, also on the fish find though there is a GPS chart plotter functionality uh, and G GPS very useful again um, you can sort of see yourself on the screen as a, as a small boat in, on sort of a base map and uh, allows you to sort of see where you're navigating to on the water um, yourself in relation to the coast etc um, really useful for sort of safety you know you can sort of track your distance from shore and uh, track the sort of speed of your drift uh, also the speed at which you're moving through the water at works really well uh, you can also get your sort of GPS um, coordinates uh, again useful if you uh, need to uh, relay those to the Coast Guard or whoever for whatever reason um, but the top part essentially for fishing it's a very good tool because it allows you to plot all your fishing marks so uh, if you've found a particularly good spot um, a, you know a drop off where there's a lot of fish or uh, somewhere where you've caught a big fish you can you can store that on the on the unit and it will save it for sort of future reference so you can navigate back to it at a later date and uh, I mean as standard these units come with a base map very basic sort of um, map which shows the coast and the water but um, you can upgrade uh, uh, to high definition seabed maps uh, or bathymetry maps um, and I use um, Navionics for this uh, Navionics card slots into the back of the unit under this cover um, basically that shows you effectively the, the map of the seabed I think it's at intervals of every 0.5 meters uh, as contours so uh, you can really easily sort of navigate to uh, drop-offs or reefs or whatever it may be that looks interesting on the seabed you can just sort of it and uh, put yourself right on top of it and then uh, use your fish finder to uh, sort of visually sort of confirm that you're over the mark uh, works really well uh, also with a GPS you can track your drift so uh, if you're drift fishing you can sort of go over one area plot your track of where you've drifted then uh you know you can either go back over that track if you've had a few good fish off it or uh you know 
uh, go on a different ground so you can you know make sure you're not covering the same ground so you're covering ground so that works really well with the uh with the gps as well um if anything the, the gps is more valuable within that unit than the uh, the fish finder particularly if you've upgraded your the, the maps to this, something like the navionics um you know being able to actually see that there's a reef you know maybe half a mile away or you know there's a there's maybe a wreck you know a mile away you you know being able to know they're there and uh head over straight towards them is uh really sort of you know priceless information so uh in terms of for fishing that unit is uh worth its weight in gold uh you know pretty pricey for fish finders i mean they start upwards of around the sort of 100 quid mark for basic ones uh ones that include gps maybe sort of 150 pounds upwards um but sort of the bigger screen ones like this five inch one uh you're looking sort of three four hundred pounds upwards um but like i said in terms of the fishing uh it's sort of really really sort of valuable uh work really well so yeah that's the uh fish finder sort of gps electronics setup on my kayak okay so let's talk a little bit about the safety equipment that we uh, carry on the kayak um so safety sort of very very important uh sort of it for kayak fishing uh sort of the safety equipment you carry with you um we sort of take it very seriously uh, you know there's sort of on a small plastic boat in a sort of big ocean or you know inland waters whatever it may be um but it's taken very seriously um you know we very much you know plan trips to uh, ensure we're staying within our comfort zone sort of within the limits of uh you know ourselves our you know our own fitness our our sort of kayak's ability um but there's always, you know, the possibility that uh, something could go wrong, uh, usually when you least expect it, even sort of in, you know, very sort of mild, calm conditions, you know, things can go wrong. So, uh, you know, when they do, we need to be sort of prepared to uh, to sort of either assist ourselves in rescue or get, get hold of someone who can sort of, get, you know, help us out. So uh, maybe the Coast Guard or other water users who can uh, sort of help rescue us or assist us um you know it's sort of worst case scenario stuff but um you've got to be prepared for it um and going out without being prepared for it is uh, sort of setting yourself up for failure and uh you know potentially a very dangerous or a tragic situation um so uh let, let's have a look at sort of the personal safety equipment uh, i carry on my kayak um sort of the main item of safety is uh this thing here uh, it's called a personal flotation device pfd for short or uh, also known as a buoyancy aid um so this is sort of, sort of a jacket style um where sort of wear it on your on your body um provides flotation uh it's an aid to buoyancy so uh sort of various ones out there on the market this one's uh sort of one of the popular ones for kite fishing uh made by uh palm equipment it's called the kai cora uh very popular because it's got a number of pockets on it. Uh, pockets been useful for sort of sawing bits of uh, fish and tackle inside uh, your phone, your camera. You know, here I've got my VHF attached to it and other uh, bits of kit. I'll uh, talk through those in a second. Um, very comfortable design, sort of curved foam within it to uh, sort of fit to the body well. Um, various adjustment straps so you can uh, sort of get a nice comfortable fit um, and a fit that's not going to uh, see the buoyancy aid coming off if you uh, did end up in the water. Uh, front entry design so uh very easy to get on and off uh nice sort of um i think they call it space mesh uh inner uh sort of makes it very breathable um but uh yeah very useful bit of kit you know it's sort of essential from the water really i mean there's no law um out there stating you have to wear a buoyancy aid on a kayak but um yeah, in my opinion yeah you're, you're mad not to um i sort of see it as uh wearing a, a seat belt in a in a car you know you'd be mad not to do it um you know you never know when uh something bad could happen out there and uh you know you, worst case scenario is that you become separated uh, from your kayak um and you're not able to get back to it or back onto it um you know if you if you're an anchor and some somehow you uh, come out of the kayak and drift away from it uh you're in big trouble really and uh you know at least having a buoyancy aid on you're going to be uh staying afloat um and you know that that, that sort of moves on to uh you know how you know in that situation you, you you're going to get you sort of help yourself or uh you know call someone to come and rescue you so um you know we carry a number of communication devices uh sort of on person you know um so 
if you did end up in the water you know you've got stuff with you where you can contact the coast guard or uh, you know another water user so uh, here we have a, a vhf radio sort of sort of seen as almost almost essential um for, for kite fish especially if you're on your own at sea um that 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 device there that gives you direct contact with the coast guard um on channel 16 there uh, so it's, it's a case of just pressing the button and you, you, you sort of talk to the coast guard there um, with vhf radios uh, there, there is a requirement to uh, pass a course to uh, legally transmit with one um, that's a course run by the uh, Royal, well certified by the royal yachting association and uh, various course providers across the country uh, it does cost money it's not free um, it's around about 100 pounds i think something like that for the course um, but I mean, what price do you put on your sort of life at the end of the day? You know, it's a, when you think of it like that, uh, it's sort of, sort, of, sort of, you know, it's nothing really. Um, so yeah, this device here, it's a VHF handheld radio. Uh, this one's made by Standard Horizon. It's a floating unit. Um, so if it does drop in the water, it's going to float. Uh, it also flashes if it gets dropped in the water, so you can sort of see it, especially in low light conditions. But um, it's got a little strobe light on the front. But uh, this particular unit, it's got inbuilt GPS. Um, so on the screen, I can see my coordinates. Um, I can also see my course over ground and also my speed over ground. You know, that, that's information there that I can relay to the, to the Coast Guard or, uh, you know, potential rescuers should I, should I need to. It's all there on the screen in front of me. Um, so I can relay that information to them. Um, also in conjunction with the uh, GPS is a system on here called uh, DSC, uh, that stands for Digital Selective Calling. Uh, and that, that, that's a system where um, basically on the side of the unit here we have a red distress button uh, under this flap, this button. You hold it, I think it's for three seconds, and uh, that will automatically send a distress signal um, to the Coast Guard and other water users with DSC units in the area. Uh, they can pick that up. Uh, along with your coordinates, it sends the coordinates with it. Uh, they can see that on their screen and uh, basically see that someone needs help in that position. And uh, if they, you know, uh, and then it's the Coast Guard can either organise someone to come and uh, uh, see, see what's going on, or uh, you know, other users in the area can come by and uh, you know see what assistance is needed. Um, there is the option on the DSC functionality to uh, actually select your type of. Uh, sort of distress call so uh, you can give them some more information if, if you if you're able to do that you know if you're in a position to do that but if not under there there's a button press that and it sends a distress signal out um, and hopefully someone will be uh, coming by to uh, sort of assist you um, it's sort of after that 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 message is sent you uh, it automatically switch you to channel 16 uh, so that uh, potential rescuers can contact you on that channel um, where you can sort of relay with them and uh, give them more information as to uh, sort of the nature of your emergency, etc. Um, that unit there, very good unit, had it a few years now, uh, works really well. Um, and that, that there, that I, I got that attached to my uh, buoyancy at the top, there's a sort of clip at the back and that sort of slots on there, so it's all sort of you know, easily accessible on the water. You know, should I end up in the water, it's right there with me. And, uh, you know, it's there as a backup in case I ever need it. Uh, you know, in a you know, in an ideal world, you'd never have to use that VHF, but you know, you know, chances are you're going to have to at some point, uh, whether it's uh, to sort of assist yourself or even assist you know other water users in, in difficulty on the water. Um, so invaluable bit of kit, um, worth every penny for, especially uh, sea fishing uh, on the kayak. Um, yeah, well, well worth getting one. It uh, also allows you to, uh, con you know, sort of talk with other water users. So it might be another kayaker or another kayak angler on the water. So if there's a group of you out there, you can uh, sort of chat amongst each other. You know, you know, in terms of sort of safety and uh, positioning and uh, sort of stuff like that. You know, it's not just for sort of you can't just go chit chatting on there. But um, you know, you can sort of select a, a channel, a working channel, something like channel six or eight we use down here. And uh, you sort of talk amongst yourselves, um, sort of relay each other's positions, so uh, you know what's going on and where everyone is on the water. Uh, so very useful for that too. Um, so yeah, VHF radio. That's one form of communication um, I've got uh, on, on myself, on my person there, on my buoyancy aid. Uh, another one, backup if the VHF won't work in. Uh, got a mobile phone here, sort of a last resort. Um, but this one here, it's in a 
waterproof case. I think this is a, this one's made by Life Edge. Uh, waterproof case. It can go in inside one of one of the aqua packs as well. Uh, but essentially, your phone you're keeping it dry in some sort of waterproof case or, or pouch. Um, you know, as a backup, it's you know in case for some reason the VHF wasn't transmitting. Um, at least I've got some other form of contact uh, using my phone. Um, I mean, it's a touchscreen phone. If any of you have ever used touchscreen with wet hands, you'll know it just doesn't work. Um, so, you know, in terms of actually calling someone on this, typing a number in, it's uh, it'd be impossible. Practically, if you were in the water, you know, in real need of call, you know, calling someone, it's not going to work. But I mean, with a lot of these smartphones now, um, they have inbuilt uh, voice controlled assistants. Um, Apple have their Siri. Um, I think it's Windows have a Cortana, I think she's called. Um, essentially, you can just manually press a button and it comes up, uh, what can I help I'm you sorry. with? And uh, what you can basically say to that is, um, call emergency services, call 999, and uh, you know by voice, the uh, phone will pick up that um, you need to call 999 or whoever it may be and uh, will you know sort of initiate that call for you without having to touch your touch screen so uh, that's sort of a, a backup there if uh, I ever needed it that would uh, you know potentially get me, get me out of a sticky situation if I ever needed uh, also on the buoyancy aid this here that there is it's called a rope cutter um, in this sheath is a, a blade curved blade very very sharp blade um, that is used for if I ever got entangled in my fishing lines, anchor line, whatever it may be. If I've ended up in the water uh, when I least expect it, my anchor line could be out, my fishing lines could be out, I could be tangled. That tangling could be preventing me getting back on the kayak and rescuing myself. Uh, well, having that little cutter on my person, um, it's in a sheath here with a with a clip. That clip is clipped onto a, a strap on this buoyancy aid. But one-handedly, I can just pull that out of its sheath and uh, start cutting and freeing myself. Um, again, ideal world, you never have to use that, but you never know when you might have to. Uh, you could also use it when you're actually on the kayak, if you need to unanchor quickly, you pull that thing out, round your anchor line, cut your anchor line, and away you go. Uh, so another sort of very important, essential really, um, safety equipment to carry on your person. Um, I mean, you can also get rescue knives, blunt-ended designs where, you know, there's no risk of sort of stabbing yourself. Again, in sort of a sheath where it's you attach. Um, but uh, I find that little, uh, I think it's, it's called a beaver trigger cutter, um, works really well. Uh, so, yeah, th that's uh, on the PFD where you need it. Um, another thing I also point out is uh, in my buoyancy aid, I have uh, a whistle. Very useful for sort of... Um, gaining the attention of people at close range so uh, you know sort of, sort of other water it might just be another kayak or something you can just whistle to gain their attention Could perhaps be sort of rescuers who are close by can't quite spot you but at least you can sort of uh, blow on the whistle and uh, get, sort of gain their attention moving on to other bits of safety equipment I like to carry on the kayak um, this thing here it is a tow line uh, Made, I just made this up out of uh, some 10 mil floating polyprop um, carabiner each end. I think it's about five meters long. That allows me to, you know, sort of clip my kayak onto another kayak if another kayak needs a tow, um, or if they need to tow me, um, or perhaps it's a boat. I can clip, you know, we can sort of tow behind a boat if ever needed to. You know, if I'm not in a position to paddle um, for or pedal for whatever reason. Um, that there sits in the back of my kayak in the rear um, storage hatch. Um, someone can reach in there and grab it if needed um, and we can sort of initiate a tow. Um, again, you never know when you might need it um, and there's been situations where that has been used when uh, friends have had uh, paddles break, break on them and uh, you know, I've even had to uh, you know, sort of help assist people out of uh, tidal runs with, uh, with this tow line where uh, they've been uh, unable to battle against the flow and uh, I've had to sort of assist and uh, sort of help, help tow people. So uh, weighs nothing, weighs nothing in the kayak, you know, it's, uh, it's not even 100 grams and, uh, you know, for potentially what it could uh, help, help get you out of, that, that, that's a you know, worthwhile bit of kit to carry. Um, again, costs, you know, less than 10 pounds to make with a, with a rope and the stainless carabiners. Uh, very worthwhile bit of kit carrying on the kayak. And uh, 
I mean, also I uh, mentioned earlier on my anchor trolley, there is um, a couple of uh, stainless rings and a carabiner. Um, my anchor trolley can actually be split, um, basically splitting the trolley in half with a carabiner loop at one end and loop at the other. And uh, that allows this trolley to form a tow line. Um, one end goes to the bow and traps against the pulley and uh, the other line comes off the back um, and I can clip that onto a kayak to tow them if needed. Um, now that idea is not something I've come up with myself, that was an idea I got from um, fellow kayak angler Mark Crane Snapper, um, you might know him from the Anglers Afloat Forum, uh, very sort of well-known, well-respected kayak angler and uh, very well experienced and he came up with that little system and uh, thought I'd incorporate it on my own kayak and it has come in useful a few times. So uh, that's another form of sort of, you know, sort of safety equipment on, on the kayak itself. And again, I mentioned earlier, the anchor system itself can be used as a, you know, an important safety um, piece of kit. If you're stuck out in conditions where uh, you c perhaps can't make headway against and uh, you need rescuing, um, you can drop your anchor down and at least hold ground um, and uh, be able to relay a static position to your rescuers instead of sort of drifting down the coast or out to sea, wherever it may be. So uh, again, your anchor system can be an important safety device. Um, uh, likewise, a drone can also be, you know, in really windy conditions. If you need to slow your drift, um, or you know, or you know, whilst fishing, or until someone comes to help you, uh, you can throw a drogue out. That will uh, catch the water and effectively uh, is, is like a break in the water. It stops you drifting with the wind, and instead you drift at the speed of uh, the sort of water below you. Um, you know that that works well in most cases but in, in some cases the tide can be running faster than the wind above it so uh, you have got to sort of watch uh, use with a drogue a little um, having fishing alongside people with drogues before um, I don't tend to use one to, to be honest and uh, um, fishing alongside people with drogues and they've actually been drifting faster than I have without a drogue so uh, there's also things like that to consider but again uh, worth carrying a drogue on you it's an important safety piece of kit and weighs nothing and whilst on the subject of uh, safety equipment, I will mention that uh, many kayak anglers like to mount uh, some form of visibility flag or safety light flag um, at the sort of back of the kayak. Um, you know, it sort of sits up sort of a metre, metre and a half or so, um, sort of above head height. Um, and uh, that's quite common amongst sort of people, especially if you're sort of in high traffic traffic areas where there's a lot of boats moving about you know you want to make sure you're visible on the water you want to make sure people can see you um, so that it can sort of give you a uh, sort of wide berth and uh, you know you're not going to go uh, ca causing collisions etc so a uh, safety flag bright orange bright yellow something like that uh, works really well to sort of uh, catch catch people's eye on the water um, and again um, often in combination with a, a light on um, a flag on the back of the kayak is a is a safety light uh, again very useful uh, for pe pedaling paddling fishing in low light conditions so dusk dawn or even night time uh, you want sort of an all-round white light is a sort of standard used on a kayak uh, and uh, that that will sort of you know sort of make other user water users sort of be able to see you more easily uh, i mean it's called visibility lights it's not for sort of visibility in terms of you being able to see better uh with a light it's it's in terms of uh you being more visible to other water users uh sort of for your own safety um so yeah another sort of popular safety item i don't have one mounted on my kite myself um the places I tend to fish, um, I, I'm usually, uh, well, I'm almost always fishing in daylight um, and there's very low traffic in the areas that I fish. Uh, quite often I don't see another boat or kayak uh, throughout the whole session. So uh, I don't have one myself, but I can easily add one on either uh, something like the uh, Yak Attack Busy Carbon Pro or the uh, Rail Laser do their visibility kits. Um, easy to mount on the back of a kayak or even on the H rails on my um, on my H crate. So uh could always add one if needed but um, I don't use one um, as sort of standard so uh, yeah that, that 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 covers a lot of the uh, safety equipment on this kayak um, I wouldn't be going out without any of it to be honest um, it's all very important kit um, you know if you if you're going out without sort of a VHF or some form of contact with the shore you know as a minimum um, you're setting yourself up for trouble if things go wrong um, so essential always
sort of have a PFD, personal flotation device, always have some form of contact with the shore um, on your person. No good having it on the kayak, no good having a VHF sat in a in sort of this side pocket or anything like that, because if you end up in the water, um, separated from the kayak, how are you then going to contact someone to rescue you? Um, you know, you really need to sort of think it through. What, you know, it's all worst case scenario stuff, but um, you really do need to know sort of how you're going to tackle things like that uh, in your head so that you're sort of fully prepared for it all. So yeah, that's uh, that covers uh, sort of standard safety equipment I carry on my kayak for practically every every fishing session I go out on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the rods and reels that I use for kayak fishing. Um, the most important sort of factor to consider when choosing a rod for kayak fishing is uh, the length of the rod. Uh, basically, you want a rod which is long enough uh, so that you can poke the tip around the bow of your kayak um, whilst fishing. Um, if you can't, it's just a it's sort of absolute nuisance because if you've got a fish running underneath the kayak uh, and your rod's stuck one side of the kayak, it can make it sort of very awkward to play the fish. Um, also sort of switching rod side to side if uh, sort of tides run in one particular way. Uh, you want to be able to put your tip around the bow to sort of move your line one side of the kayak to the other. Um, in general, uh, sort of a seven to eight foot is about sort of spot on size for uh, practically any fishing kayak. Uh, some of the very short fishing kayaks you can get away with sort of a six foot rod. Um, but you definitely wouldn't want to go any shorter to be honest. Um, otherwise you'll just end up having to sort of lean forward a long way from sort of the, the seating area to, to actually poke your line around the bow. Uh, which is, sort of makes it more hassle than it needs to be to be honest. Um, so I mean a lot of companies sort of market fishing rods for, for kayaks sort of four foot, five foot, six foot. Uh, to be honest, it's better steering away and actually just going for a seven foot or eight foot sort of rod. Uh, they tend to be best. Um, I mean, I've got a variety of rods, various weights, uh, various reel sizes uh, for kayak fishing. It all depends on what sort of species you're targeting. Uh, in general, on a kayak, you can go sort of much lighter uh, than you would sort of fishing from a boat or the shore. Um, so it sort of can make it very fun, very sporting uh, for what you're going for. Um, I mean, I'll start with this rod here. This is a H2O Rockfish Revolution uh, with a H2O Law Game Reel. Uh, small, light setup. The rod is uh, rated 7 to 28 grams, uh, 7 foot 10 inches long. Um, this rod's great for sort of very light fishing, uh, so sort of LRF styles, uh, flicking light lures around, small metal jigs, etc. Uh, also great for sort of fishing for the mini species uh, in the competitions with small sabiki rigs. Um, I've got that reel loaded up with braid, uh, I think that's 12 pound braid. Um, I use braid on all my reels, braid's uh, sort of invaluable really of kite fishing or fishing in boat fishing in general. Um, I mean the sensitivity you get with braid um, is that much more than mono, uh, there's the sort of stretching monofilament line and you just don't get the uh, sort of sort of feel you do with uh, the non-stretch braid, you can sort of see the bites much easier, you can see when you're sort of hitting snaggy ground much easier, uh, you feel every sort of pluck and knock on the, on the sort of lure or bait, so uh, braid, it, you know, very, very much worth the money, it's more expensive than mono but, but uh, very much worth it uh, it will catch you more fish uh, and that's uh, without doubt uh, so yeah all my reels loaded up with braid uh, so yeah that's sort of my light setup there uh, the h2o rod uh, lovely little rod I've had that a couple of years now but, uh, great fun especially if you look a bigger fish on it it's a very light rod very sensitive tip um, look a bigger fish and it really gives it a workout um, sort of going up a step um, this this rod here, you, this gets used a lot. This is a it's an ugly stick custom graphite. Uh, it's a 30 to 60 gram rated lure rod, eight foot long. Um, it's basically just a spinning rod. Um, I don't think they make this model anymore. It's a discontinued American model, but um, they do various other models, current models now, uh, very similar weight. Uh, I think the ugly stick elite's one of them. Um, uh, but th this rod, this is my all round lure rod um, for sort of. Uh, sort of fishing for pollock, bass, um, cod, whatever whatever it may be on the laws. Um, it works really well for vertical jigging, deep water, uh, also for sort of casting laws, um, trolling laws. This is my sort of all-round law rod. Uh, I've 
have Pollock up to well nearly 14 pounds on this and uh, some nice bass to just under eight pounds etc um, but it handle them really well nice sort of sensitive flicky tip but uh, a lot of backbone in the rod for sort of holding on to the bigger fish uh, and that's paired up with a it's a Daiwa fixed spool this one uh, 2500 size um, in general any low rod uh, sort of a 2500 to sort of 4000 size fixed spools uh, work well uh, again this one's loaded up with braid I think this one's got a Berkeley whiplash on it but that works really well uh, I mean not just for law fishing really uh, can do a bit of light bait fishing on this so uh, sort of light bottom work uh, you know just flicking out sort of an ounce of lead a couple of ounces of lead on the bottom with a small bait picking up small flat fish or small wrasse etc uh, that works quite well uh, good fun as well because it's obviously a light rod yeah so uh, moving up from that sort of get on to my sort of main bait fishing rods uh, this one here uh, I mean, up till recently, I've been using uh, Ugly Stick, uh, the GX2 uh, kayak rods. So I think there's some for four inch, some for six inch, something like that. Uh, six to 12 pounds. Uh, very good rods they've been. Um, great for all, all sorts of fishing, all round kayak fishing. Um, but recently, uh, I think it was in the Swanage comp this year, I won this one here, the Fladden Maximus Solid Carbon. Um, it's called the STS series. Um, it's uh, seven foot long. 10 to 20 pounds it features a solid carbon blank uh, whereas most rods are tubular carbon um, gives it a slightly different feel but a very light soft tip um, but a lot of backbone and power in the sort of lower half of the rod uh, works really well for holding on to bigger fish um, I mean I, I use this for sort of all sorts um, works really well for sort of drift fishing for flat fish uh, gurnards uh, I mean I've had ray on this blonde ray up to 17 pound uh, I've had ling up to 17 pound on this from the boat even had some small blue sharks on this setup um, on this rod it works really well there's a lot of power in, the, in this this rod but it remains really light and sensitive at the top end for sort of even small species so uh, this has become a little favorite of mine recently um, paired up with a Finor lethal 40 reel uh, loaded up with I think this is 29 pound dial with J braid um, and this combo here has caught me all sorts this summer uh, re really like it um, so that's a great all-round rod for kayak fishing Re really nice little setup and uh, yeah from anything from the sort of smaller flat fish and uh, gurnards and wrasse up to sort of bigger ray um, that would even hold tote that rod um, it, 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 it will handle it it's got the power there but um, for the bigger fish, for the rays, the taupe, uh, congas, anything like that, that's uh, really going to sort of, you know, give you a, a good pullback. Um, I've got sort of stepped up gear for that. And uh, for that, I like this rod. Uh, been a personal favourite of mine for many years. The Ugly Stick Braid Rods uh, in the 12 to 20 pound. Um, this is eight foot long. Um, it's actually a discontinued American model again. Um, recently, Ugly Stick have sort of changed they're sort of manufacturing mainly to uh, I think it's manufactured in China now um, uh, sort of made cheaper there's a cheaper price point so they're really good on price but uh, not quite the quality of the uh, older American um, manufactured rods such as this one here but um, yeah if you ever see one of these around pick one up they're brilliant rods uh, and I'll use this for, for yeah I've had tape on this uh, you know, big ray, um, con plenty of congas on it, uh, bullass, all, it's sort of the bigger fish. If I'm targeting the bigger fish, this is the rod I'll be using. I've uh, got a pair of these. And, uh, it's paired up with uh, this multiplier here. It's an Avet um, SX uh, 5.3 uh, lever drag multiplier. Not cheap, but beautiful reel to use. Uh, I'm really a fan of lever drags on uh, multipliers. Uh, just operate a lot lot better a lot smoother than the uh, star drags um, coming on many other reels but um, that one there is loaded up I think this one's got 40 pound braid on so just a bit beefier for the bigger fish um, really good reel really reliable like it a lot um, but to be honest I mean with any 12 to 20 pound rod um, a multiplier sort of in the in the 6500 sizing um it works fine with a with a 12 to 20 pound rod i mean you can step up to a 7000 size if it's bigger fish again and you want to sort of have a bit more sort of cranking power um then you can step up the reel size a bit but i find that sort of size reel there 
which is uh, sort of equivalent to a 6500 size, uh, it works fine and that's fine for sort of bigger fish. But, um, again, there's, uh, there's other rods, specialist rods, um, you can use for various species, you know, you might have specific mullet rods or specific conger rods. I mean, I've got some really heavy sort of 50 pound class rods for when I go out on the deep wrecks, where there's, you know, there's always a chance of 50 pound plus conger eel. So uh, you really want some really beefy heavy gear to actually uh, sort of haul those up. Um, you know, there's potentially fish out there over 100 pounds. So uh, I have got the gear to tackle them, but uh, in general, uh, you know, it do doesn't get used very often. But these sort of four sort of examples here, uh, they cover 90% of my fishing. Uh, and uh, yeah, sort of great for all round kite fishing, covers sort of all the bases. Um, so yeah, that, that that's my uh, sort of standard fishing rods and reels that I use uh, during my kite fishing sessions uh, for saltwater fishing down here in Cornwall. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how I've got cameras and video cameras sort of set up on my my Hobie Revolution 16. Um, sort of as fishermen, most of us like to uh, uh, get pictures of a catch or uh, shoot some footage of us uh, sort of fishing, um, catching a fish. Uh, you can get some pretty awesome shots out there on the water. Um, you know, it can not be just of fishing, uh, it could also be the wildlife. There might be sort of dolphins or whales around where, uh, you know, you get, get recording the sort of footage of you, uh, you know, being out there with them. It's, uh, you can get some really, really great videos. Um, so yeah, I've got, um, I use, well, myself, I use a, a GoPro Hero um, video camera. Uh, it's what I'm recording with now. Um, and I have that mounted sort of just behind me, behind the seating area, sort of shooting over my shoulder on this, on this pole here. Um, you can see this sort of case with the GoPro up here. Uh, it's mounted onto uh, a one inch ramble there, GoPro adaptable. Um, and then this here is a, well, DIY, sort of um, camera pole, camera boom here. Um, it's actually made from a carbon paddle shaft uh, from a broken broken paddle. Um, acquired that, cut it down. Um, I've attached some, uh, some of the um, clamps, uh, one inch at one end, um, 1.5 inch at the other end from RAM. Um, usually come with their extension poles, but I've just adapted it to uh, fit this uh, carbon paddle shaft. Which I've cut to sort of the perfect size so that one I can sort of reach it easily from the seat to uh, operate the controls um, and two uh, it gets sort of a really wide angle shot over my shoulder of the sort of all the action so that's there it's all sort of fully adjustable off this ball and socket um, set up again from RAM um, and the base attached to the H-rail on my crate here the H-crate using uh, the Hobie H-rail uh, RAM 1.5 inch ball um, so that attaches there, it can easily be clipped off if I need to, uh, and move along, move back, forwards, I uh, can easily, you know, sort of undo and uh, tilt tilt the arm to get some sort of side shots or, you know, I can sort of have it low, up high, wherever it may, may need to be. That's all easy to uh, sort of grab from the seating area. So uh, that's where I have my camera most of the time to catch the sort of shots. Uh, if I want to, I can un take the pole off undo the clamp, take it off and uh, use that pole to dip in the water if I want to get some underwater shots at all. Uh, so that's, that's sort of my front facing camera, sort of goes in this position here so you can sort of get a wide angle shot over the sort of kayak and usually get your rod tips in with all the action, uh, fighting a fish, playing a fish, landing a fish, whatever it may be. Um, so that's there. Um, I've also got a couple of other options where I can mount my camera. Um, we can take this GoPro casing uh, and we can move that. Uh, can put it up on the bow if I want to have a bow mounted camera um, shot looking back over the kayak. Um, this here is a is a rock mount, a rock mini mount uh, made by a company called Scanstrut. Really solid uh, piece of kit. Uh, it's mounted on a suction cup actually this one because uh, it's a Hobie, very smooth surface to the plastic. Uh, this suction cup actually grips to it really well. It's also leashed just in case that suction cup failed but that sticks on there really well. Um, it's sort of a modular system where, where you can sort of press a button on the back of the mount, pop it off, and then you can move that to other mounts. But um, that just clips on there, clicks into place, really solid fit. Again, ball and socket technology in here where you can sort of adjust it at any angle. But on top of this adapter here sits that GoPro housing, which is uh, currently on the back camera pole. But that then 
sort of sits in this position, looking back over the kayak, um, and sort of gets wide angle shots from there. Um, usually when I've got the camera in this position, I've, I've removed this. Um, my fish finder is either not on the kayak or it's on the side slide tracks so that you can get sort of a better view down the length of the kayak. Uh, and I like to have the camera in this position, especially when it's really rough and you can sort of smash through sort of big waves. It looks pretty awesome as uh, the camera's sort of, sort of dipping through the water and uh, get, getting you charging through all the sort of rough conditions. So uh, that works really well up there. Uh, also great for just when you're, you're not fishing and you're just going for a paddle scenic paddle uh, you get some really good shots of uh, you sort of touring around the coast or rivers or whatever it may be from uh, the front at angle there uh, I can also um, mention there's uh, on the back pole a uh, little custom one inch ram ball there uh, that attaches to the GoPro housing that ball can be uh, sort of taken off this clamp here I can move that to the extension arm here where my rod holder usually is take the rod holder out where that one inch ball is, pop the camera in place, and then sort of have have that sort of shot there, looking back over the, the cockpit. Again, that's another very good one for sort of when you're fishing, uh, looking back over, getting getting shots of the action. Sort of downside with it in that position is you often cut out a bit of the uh, sort of rod tip action, uh, don't quite get all the rods in, which is why I prefer it, uh, sort of at the back, facing forward, so you can sort of capture all the action. Uh, also, I mean that's, that's the GoPro um, video recorder sort of positions, um, getting video footage. I uh, also have a still camera um, that's located in my buoyancy aid PFD in the pocket, easy access. Uh, that's what I take all the pictures of my fish on uh, and all the sort of still shots of uh, the action. Uh, I mean I can also record with this if I want, but uh, I usually do that with a GoPro. But onto that I've got a couple of cork balls uh, in the event I knock that in or drop it in the water it's going to float at least give me a chance to get it back instead of it sinking to the bottom um, so th that works really well get some really good shots with that it's all sorts of functionalities in that to get some really really great pictures uh, and that one there is an Olympus Tough it's a waterproof camera uh, shock proof and dust proof all that sort of business it's a, basically an outdoors camera um, this has had some real abuse over the years. I've had this for about uh, three or four years now, and um, costs around 150, 160 pounds. But absolutely um, brilliant bit of kit. You know, I can get this absolutely soaked in the kayak. I can dip it in the water, get some underwater shots, and uh, it takes it all. It's got some really good seals uh, where the sort of memory card is located in the uh, charging ports. Um, so yeah, in kayak fishing, and really rate the Olympus Tough Range. I mean, this particular model, um, it's, it's sort of discontinued now, been superseded by various other models, um, but still they all use this sort of great design and rugged design, uh, meant to take sort of the abuse of, uh, you know, sort of outdoor activities such as kayaking. So yeah, really great bit of kit. So that there sort of covers uh, sort of ways I take pictures uh, and record footage on my on my fishing kayak. Okay so uh, I'll just talk quickly about some of the other items I sometimes carry on my kayak. Um, some people have them as sort of standard on their kayaks. Um, sort of, I sometimes carry, carry these bits and bobs but um, this one here, uh, a leash. Um, a lot of people use leashes um, for, for sort of tethering all sorts to the kayak. Um, sort of, I often uh, have my paddle tethered at all times. Um, that's sort of pretty important to keep to the kayak. But um, a lot of guys uh, use leashes for, for sort of their fishing rods as well. Um, so, you know, in the event of capsize whilst you're fishing, um, you know, at least sort of uh, everything's attached to the kayak, so it's not going to be sort of disappearing to the to the depths. Uh, you're not going to lose your favourite rod or reel or whatever it is. Um, sort of over the years, I've found that leashes sort of cause more trouble than they're worth, to be honest. Uh, they cause more tangles and uh, they just get in the way. Um, so I've just sort of accepted that uh, I'm not going to leash my stuff. And uh, if I did capsize, uh, fingers crossed I haven't yet, but if I did capsize, I'm going to lose my gear. But... Uh, you know, if, I, if I've capsized, I've probably got bigger things to worry about than my favourite rod and reel. So, uh, you know, number one being getting back on the kayak and getting back to shore. So, um, yeah, I, I, as a rule, I don't, don't tend to leash my rods and reels. Um, occasionally will if I'm fishing for sort of really big fish where there's a chance for it ripping my rod out of my hand. Um, you know, I have leashed it in a few occasions like that. But, um, 
you know sort of general fishing law fishing uh bait fishing i don't, I don't tend to leash my gear but um you know there's, there's lots of leashes out there on the market uh this is a palm equipment one i'm using for my uh sort of paddle but there's all sorts of uh, bungee coil designs um you know even just uh using a piece of sort of fishing line you can sort of tie your rod onto the kayak if it needed to be attached but um you know they're f fairly inexpensive bits of kit uh in the kite kayaking world kite fishing world uh, as a saying uh leash it or lose it and uh you know if you did capsize and it wasn't leashed then yeah you, you're probably going to be losing it there um i mean the h crate itself i mean whilst i'm paddling i can actually leash the rods to this quite clever there's a piece of bungee which you sort of pull out on a tab you can wrap it around the real seat and back down under a little retainer and that actually holds the rod in place so uh, I, I tend to do that if i'm uh, uh pedaling out especially in rougher conditions where there is the chance of a wave actually uh you know could, could come and catch me off guard and uh, turn the kayak over and have me in the water um i can sort of have my rods attached there so uh they're not going to be falling out um but actually whilst fishing um i don't, I don't tend to have them leashed uh, sort of whilst they're on my rod rest or uh you know sort of whilst i'm trolling with a rod so uh but uh you know leashes they are a fairly standard piece of kit on a lot of uh, people's fishing kayaks um another piece of equipment i will point out um should point out earlier in the safety uh, section uh, it's this, this thing here uh, it's a deck mounted compass uh this one's um made by silver uh well-known uh, sort of compass manufacturer uh, they make this one specific for uh, mounting onto the deck of a kayak uh, this one here is held on with uh, a couple of bungee cords and with hooks so it can be clipped on very easily onto practically any fishing kayak just sort of sits on top can be uh, screw mounted in but uh, this makes it a nice removable system um, this here uh, I, I don't always uh, take it out with me but um, so, so, some occasions especially when I know it's going to be a bit foggy or a bit uh, uh, sort of drizzly or whatever it may be where there's sort of low visibility um, I might lose track of the shore um, you know, I've got my GPS as my main sort of um, primary means of navigating back to the coast. But um, for any reason that went down, uh, battery run out, or there was some sort of fault in the unit, uh, I couldn't get a GPS fix, whatever it may be. Um, I can move that out of the way uh, and have view of my uh, my compass here, uh, sort of dead down the centre of the kayak, so I can sort of see see easily as I'm moving along, so I can easily sort of navigate back to shore using using uh, the sort of compass there. Um, I think it costs around £50, pounds, um, but it is, uh, I mean, you can get cheaper deck mount compasses, but silver is sort of uh, one of the best on the market, uh, top bit of kit. Uh, so that's their sort of self leveling design. So if it's a bit choppy, um, the dial will sort of self level and allow you to still sort of read read your bearing off that. So, uh, yeah, a couple, couple of bits of uh, extra gear there uh, worth pointing out uh, whilst we're uh, looking over my kite fishing setup. Okay, another very important piece of kit, uh, practically essential really, is uh, is a trolley. Um, I mean, these fishing kayaks, you know, once laden up with gear, they're, they're pretty heavy to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, this this particular model, the Hobie Revolution 16. I mean, once laden up with its uh, seat and drive and paddle, I mean, it's it's over the 40 kilo mark. You know, there's there's no way you can move that around without without a trolley. Um, I mean, if you've got two of you, you can carry it short distance, but um, the time you've loaded it up with a bit of fishing gear, you know, it's well over sort of 50 kilos. Uh, and that goes for most fishing kites, to be honest, you know, there's a, once laden up, there's not a lot that are very light, uh, easy to carry yourself. So uh, a trolley is a, an essential bit of kit. Um, probably the most popular one out there is what we're looking at here. It's uh, called the Railblazer Sea Tug. Um, this is a cradle style trolley um, and by that I mean it the, the kayak sits in this sort of cradle these pads here um, you might see some trolleys where um, they have poles sticking up uh, which go through the scupper holes on the kayak uh, scupper holes are sort of placed in kayaks I'll show you some here here the Hobie has some here to allow sort of draining of the the, the area auto bailing should water come over the side they drain down the scupper holes well um, some some trolleys are designed where prongs go up through these scuppers and uh, sort of uh, you trolley it along on those. Um, to be honest, not recommended for fishing kayaks because uh, you got such sort of weight, um, you know, on the kayak. It puts a lot of force if there's metal against plastic on this section, and a lot of people end up damaging their kayaks, splitting them, and uh, getting leaks. 
um, you know it can potentially cause a very sort of bad situation if your kite's leaking whilst you're on the water and you you, you didn't realize so uh, that style of trolley called a through scupper trolley uh, not really recommended for fishing kayaks uh, I certainly wouldn't use one but um, I mean Hobie in particular they manufacture that style of trolley but um, their, their own kayaks they reinforce the scupper holes you might be able to see some black lining in in the scupper hole there they reinforce them to prevent any sort of damage to the scupper hole so the Hobie trolleys can actually be used you know through these scup holes you know without worry but um in general fishing kayaks uh, stay away from the through scupper style trolley go for a cradle style such as a sea tug this is the best one on the market to be honest um practically everyone ends up getting one at some point if you're you're into your kayak fishing um so yeah kayak sits on these pads uh, great thing is you can place this trolley at the sort of center weight of your kayak which is usually just under the seating area so that everything's nicely balanced over the wheels so that when you pick up the bow end to drag your kayak it well feels weightless uh, this almost because it's all perfectly balanced over the wheels um, so yeah nice strap that goes around the kayak prevents the trolley slipping out of place whilst you're pulling it along nice rubberized pads to grip the hull and these sort of auto level um, to the shape of the hull to sort of cradle it and support the weight uh, so yeah, this 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 one here is a, sort, of, sort of uses their latest wheels uh, called Sandtrax wheels. You can see they have sort of a strange design. Well, that design there um, allows the wheels to compress. You can sort of see they're squiddy there, um, under weight. And as you do that, it creates more surface area at the bottom of the wheel. Um, spreads the weight out, which is particularly good over soft sand. Stops the wheels digging in. Um, I've used a previous wheel to this, which is a bit smaller. Um, and in soft sand it just digs in whereas this style here really does uh, help help the trolley sort of go over soft sand uh, makes it a lot easier for those beach launches um, and dragging your kite back up to the car after a long session um, so well worth the money uh, and it's all sort of a modular design where these pads lift up they pop off very easy uh, the wheels have some little clips here and they lift up, wheels pop off. Same with the other side. That frame does come in two. Most people leave it in one piece because it will fit in a hatch anyway. But now all that will go straight in the bow hatch, sort of as I, as I showed earlier in the video. Uh, but the Sea Tug trolley, well worth the money, around uh, well over the just over the hundred pound mark. But um, I mean, they, they save you that much uh, effort, sort of launching and landing. They're worth every single penny, uh, and uh, you won't really find anyone that will uh, tell you otherwise. To be honest, they're a great bit of kit. You know, I've been using that one now for around five years, and it's, uh, it's you know really taking the abuse. Um, all sort of plastic construction, so nothing really to rust. There is some metal in the uh, axles, but it's a uh, three one six stainless, so uh, it won't be going uh, really rusty there at all. It'll uh, suitable for sort of salt water and sort of fresh water use really good good design bomb proof so very much recommended by myself okay guys so uh, that about covers it for my fishing kayak setup uh, the Hobie Revolution 16 uh, 2017 model with the Mirage Drive 180 uh, show sort of how I've got it all kitted out for my uh, sort of own fishing down here in Cornwall on the sea, sort of inshore, offshore waters. Um, how I've got things laid out, how I've got things rigged, installed, etc. So uh, hopefully that'll be of help to some of you, um, you know, particularly newcomers to the sport who might be uh, looking sort of to see what it's all about, um, how to rig a fishing kayak, uh, what's involved, the kit you require. Um, you know, when starting out in the sport, it can uh, be a little bit be a little bit mind-blowing sometimes as to what what's needed out there uh, and a lot of it's not essential um, but you know it's you know I definitely didn't start out with all this kit it's something you build up over time but uh, certainly the the safety side of it is very worth um, sort of paying particular notice to and uh, making sure you're kitted out to uh, you know be out there kite fishing safely uh, it's very important and we take it very seriously so uh hope that's of, uh, helped you and uh, you, you sort of take some ideas from the video and, uh, and sort, of, sort of for your own fishing and your own, uh, own kayak. So uh, 
if anyone's got any questions uh wants to know any more detail on any particular thing i've spoke about in the video uh feel free to comment below the video um or dr drop me a message um through my website www.kayakfishing.blog okay tight lines <laughs>